Um, most of these days I'm, I'm programming in Excel, so, you know, right, right click, insert, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, pretty, pretty powerful stuff. Um, so tonight, though, what I've been doing very recently is uh, working a lot with nerves and getting super excited about it, um, and I wanted to share that with you guys and gals tonight. Um, first of all, thanks to Gaslight for um, hosting the, the venue here and uh, being awesome in general, and also for recording the presentation so I can put it online and uh, help some more people learn about nerves. So I want to start off the talk with uh, why embedded. Um, one of the main drivers that's driving embedded right now is this thing that people are calling Internet of Things, um, which basically just means small computers um, doing things that they probably shouldn't and talking to other things that they probably shouldn't. Um, <laughs> But so basically where that is is, you know, you can pay uh, less than $100 for one of these things that you might have considered a supercomputer 20 years ago, um, and they fit in your pocket. And, you know, there's several of them on the desk here, and it's not a big deal. Um, I wanted to talk in particular about the BeagleBone Black board. Um, if I go back a slide, it's the, it's the more expensive one here, but um, it has a lot of cool things going for it. One of the main things that's cool about it is it's open hardware. Um, so unlike the Raspberry Pi, where basically you can't get the chip that's on the Raspberry Pi because I don't know why. I mean, I guess Broadcom just doesn't sell it. They don't sell, give you data sheets for it. Um, this one has a TI processor that you can get lots of information about it. Um, the circuit board is open source, so you can like respin the board with just the stuff on it that you want for a product that you're going to build or something like that. Um, has lots of great peripherals like uh, CAN bus if you want to do automotive stuff. Uh, and then industrial temperature option on the processor is a cool feature, too, if you're trying to really sell a product, um, you know, put something inside a car. I guess that'd be automotive, but still, you know, different, different functions that you can do with industrial temperature range. What is with industrial temperature? Um, minus 40 to plus 85 Celsius, I think. Um, yeah, commercial is, is uh, 0 to 70, I think. Um, so, like, you can't go below freezing, basically, with a, with a commercial part. I mean, you can, but it'll probably fail or fail earlier or something like that. Um, whereas industrial gives you a wider range. You can, you know, put it inside refrigerated rooms and, you know, stuff like that. Uh, and run it hotter. You know, plus, uh, plus 85 is pretty darn hot. I don't know what that is in Fahrenheit, but it's hot. Um, so another key point I wanted to make here is that uh, Elixir is really kind of designed for embedded. Um, and, you know, Erlang is designed for embedded and Elixir by extension. It has fault tolerance, fast, fast garbage collection, um, designed for con concurrency, uh, designed for constrained hardware, which is interesting because it was designed so long ago that basically all the hardware was constrained by today's terms. Um, and it's also designed for you know, running. Uh, it's, it's ah, nice. So let's, re let's reboot the projector here. Just this? Yes. Hold on. Right there. Yes. Yeah, we did this last time, and then we forgot about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't write your own time library. I'll just take that public service announcement opportunity, you know. Especially differences between time, you would think that would be a constant, but. But if you're using the Elixir, your time database is automatically updated. Yeah. Fun story about time from last night while we're waiting for this to reboot. I was trying to run this Erlang library for DHCP so that I could do some of the magic that I wish I could show tonight. Uh, and it wouldn't work because, you know, erlang.time.now or whatever wasn't a thing anymore because it's deprecated. So apparently, yeah, there's this new thing about time warps and stuff. I don't, I don't really understand what this is, so I just wanted it to work. <laughs> a quick question on the hardware. I, I heard that there are, and I'm not in that world, but I heard that on the Beagle board that if you come up with something, that there's all these little boutiques to where they'll design a board for you or whatnot. So if you've got, need 30% of what a Beagle board does, you can get a special application board made in low quantity, is that? Is you that certainly could do that um, by yourself. I don't know whether the BeagleBone company does that or not, but. BeagleBone does do it, but there's services out there. Oh yeah, yeah, there certainly are services That's for doing that. That's what i that it's a lot of startups, uh, makers are, are going Yeah, to Yeah, that's what I was saying with the um, open source design for the schematic on the, on the um, print and circuit board, you, you know, if you have the skills, you can do that yourself. Whereas with many of the platforms, probably most of them, um, you're kind of doing it from scratch if you want to do anything on your own. Um, whereas with the BeagleBone, like you could download their schematic, just basically select and delete the things that you don't want to pay for on your product, right? And then you're, you just, you send it off to one of the low volume, like uh, 
Osh Park, OSH Park is like an open source hardware uh, circuit board place. There's Batch PCB. There's different places to get a circuit board made. Um, yeah, so I think I was at concurrency. <laughs> oh, constrained hardware, yeah. So uh, Erlang was designed for telephone switches and stuff from a long time ago that, um, you know, they didn't have much memory, didn't have much processor, but you can put a big rack of them together and cluster them. Um, and then it's really good at binary protocols, which is fun and interesting when you want to, you know, have that high efficiency in message, pa message passing, uh, among other things. So there's lots of other reasons that Elixir's awesome. Um, the main focus today is about nerves. Um, so basically, um, this is Frank Hunleth, um, and he started the Nerves Project. I don't remember when. I should have wrote that on the slide. Um, it was recently, um, last five years maybe, last something like that. Um, and then there's also this project called Cellulose that was started by Garth Hitchens and Chris Dutton um, because they wanted to uh, use it in their products where they work at Rose Point Navigation Systems. Um, and Cellulose basically does similar things to what Nerves is doing, um, but there's, there was some overlap there, but there was also some lack of overlap if you think about a Venn diagram. Um, so they got together and said, hey, you know what, it would be great if there were three of us on this team instead of one on one team and two on the other. Um, so now the Nerves Project is, is both of those things. Um, a lot of the excitement about Nerves recently, I think, has been sparked by Garth's talk at, um, uh, where was this, Elixir Conf, Conf 2015. So embedded Elixir in action, you should look that presentation up and um, check it out because he goes into some good depth about you know, the history and why and all that stuff that I didn't really want to cover again. Um, and also he's going to be giving a talk at Elixir Days in March. Um, so check that out. Um, this is a picture of the product that they're selling, just to give you a kind of a gut feel. This is, you know, there's an Ethernet jack to give you a scale, because we're nerds. Um, and a serial port, you know. Yeah, so, uh, so they make these things that go on boats, you know, for mapping and uh, navigation on boats. Pretty cool stuff. Um, we were talking a little bit earlier about uh, Raspbian um, as opposed to Nerves. So, this is uh, completely stolen from his slide deck, uh, but it gives you a feel for, you know, Raspbian takes 30 to 60 seconds to boot as opposed to a Nerves app is in your app in three to six seconds. Uh, and, you know, on down the list, there's different cool stuff that Nerves gives you that, um, you know, Raspbian basically is a Linux distribution that comes with Raspberry Pi. You can boot into it and it's just a computer, right? You can compile Erlang, you can compile Elixir, you can build your thing. Um, but Nerves kind of shortcuts a lot of that stuff and I wanna, that's what I wanna talk about. Um, so this is what Nerves is. Um, this is also from Garth's talk. Um, it says where we're headed because at the time of his talk, a lot of the stuff wasn't ready yet um, and didn't really work. Um, but now it actually works pretty well. It's, it's worth getting into it. Um, there's some infrastructure, some tooling, and some libraries um, that you can take a look at. Um, basically gives you everything you need to start developing an Elixir on an embedded device very easily. So, so along came uh, Justin Schneck, uh, who was super excited about Nerves and decided to work on this thing called Bakeware um, for reasons that we'll talk about in a minute. Um, basically, Bakeware is what helps you build your Nerves app easily um, on different kinds of hardware instead of being Linux only. Um, so this is kind of the whole ecosystem where Nerves project offers uh, Erlinit, um, FW up, build root, and oh well, some build root configurations and the cell uh, tools. Uh, I have the cell tool in dots there because it's not actually integrated into Nerves yet. It's kind of a separate cellulose thing. So that's yet to be finalized. Um, I don't think I put a slide in here about Erlinit, but uh, yeah, okay. So this, I guess I'll talk about Erlinit here. This is kind of the flow that you um, kind of conceptualize as you're building your Nerves app. Um, this gray box here in the middle is the stuff that Nerves gives you, and then Erlinit and FW up also come along with Nerves. Um, if you're doing Elixir, you probably recognize the mix tool and you know make. Um, build root is a thing for building a minimal Linux image, uh, including cross compilation. Um, so you're basically going to go get the Linux source files from you know Linux, right? It's just Linux, and then um, build root configures that so that you get only the stuff that you're going to run want to run, um, not like every possible driver that may be supported on every version of Linux ever. Um, which is why Raspbian is so big because it's supposed to just work out of the box. Um, and then this thing called Erlinit is on top of that. So normally in Linux, there's this process called init that is the first thing that runs and it makes your other stuff run, uh, manages a bunch of stuff. So Erlinit is that, except it's written in Erlang and it's really just for running an Erlang release. Um, it's very simplified and um, 
it's tuned for this use case, basically. Do you go out and get your own Linux source, or do you use something like Alpine? Or um, Nerves does that for you, so as far as I'm concerned, it's magic. I, I don't even know how it works. So they, so they have that in the cloud? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think it just checks it out from uh, Git, you know, from wherever the Linux Git source is. Um, and then you got your standard make, so this is like if you have C code or something, um, Nerves knows how to cross compile that for your Raspberry Pi, which by the way runs ARM instead of x86, so like it's not just portable code. Um, and then the same thing for Mix for your Elixir projects. Um, it just kind of works magically and makes these Erlang releases and then it all gets packed up into this firmware image and then you use um, this far, uh, firmware update utility to get it onto an SD card. So a lot to swallow, but it's very easy. All you do is, you know, it just does most of the magic for you. So basically the, the, just, the gist here is that you're just using mix and make like you would for any other Elixir project, right? It's not super exciting when you really look at the details. Um, the bad part about this is that it takes a long time to get set up. Um, the, the actual build doesn't take super long, but actually getting nerves installed takes a long time because it has to go download a lot of dependencies and you know, this particular version of Linux and this particular version of the, all these drivers and stuff. So uh, it also requires Linux because it is, you know, it is Linux, right? So it works better on Linux to, um, to build your Linux images. So that's where uh, Bake comes in. So Bake simplifies a lot of that stuff and it comes from the cloud uh, instead of having to compile it yourself. So you're not building Linux anymore. You're just putting your app code in and Bake is putting out your firmware image. Um, the slow part takes place in the cloud still, so somebody else's problem. And then the fast part takes place on my computer. So uh, this is my uh, slide about, you know, this is a, the nurse team is small. Um, I'm kind of putting myself in there, right? So there's, there's number five at the bottom and then there's you down there too. So there's, there's a bunch of you here. I, I wanna see the, the community growing here. Um, there's maybe like 200-ish people in the Elixir Lang Slack for the Nerves channel, um, and a, a couple people joining every week, including uh, Chris McCord, so you know, wanna be in cool company, there he is. Um, some stuff that's coming up soon with Nerves is um, better getting started documentation. Um, I wrote some blogs about it recently, and I'm gonna uh, help out with their you know, public-facing website stuff as well. Um, better integration with, uh, between Nerves and Bakeware and Nerves and Mix. Um, just to make things more seamless. Um, Wi-Fi support right now is kind of weak because like I was talking about, you don't want to build every possible driver into your Linux image or else it'll be huge. Um, so we want to figure out like which are the few models that we want to support and then have some way to slipstream just the one you're using into your project by configuration or something. Um, I mentioned the cell tool, which is for managing uh, nodes on the network. Um, that doesn't really work with nerves yet, but um, coming soon. Um, there's this rel sync tool for kind of live reload in your development environment, which I'm sure you Ruby developers are used to and uh, would love to have, you know, on your Raspberry Pi, right? Like you're, you're writing your code and then it's already there without SD card burning. And then Bakeware on Windows currently doesn't exist, but um, Linux and Mac are there. All right, so um, I want to do a quick demo slash walkthrough of like how do you use the, the tool. Um, and we're going to be, so we're going to be hacking the Gibson, I, I hope people are getting this reference, right? This is uh, the movie Hackers from the late 80s. Yes, okay. Um, the Gibson's gonna be the Raspberry Pi because, you know, Gibson's, right? Probably had like 64K of RAM or something. <laughs> um, so I need you all to just read the slide really quick. No. Um, basically, this is, this is to give you a feel for how you install um, Bakeware. Uh, so on Mac OS, there's, you know, a script where you just run this thing from the internet. I'm sure it'll be fine. Um, and then on Ubuntu 14.04, um, there's, there's a description of, you know, some dependencies that you need and then you run the script from the internet. Um, and, it's, and it's fine, again, it just works. Don't worry about it. <laughs> um, so then after you get all the stuff from the internet, that's, that's really cool, um, then you just mix new, you know, just like any Elixir project, you're just making a, an Elixir project. Um, and then in your mix file, the secret sauce is that you put this Nerves application in there and you put this Nerves dependency in there and then basically you're done. That's, that's Nerves for you. Um, I have this NeoPixel thing in here. These are called NeoPixels, these LEDs that I'm gonna be showing. So um, that's my particular app. Um, this is a bake file. So you're familiar with make files, rake files, whatever, uh, Docker files, all the, all the different files. You have to have a file or else you aren't cool. Um, so this is a bake file. 
Um, you tell it what platform you're on, which is NERVS in this case. Uh, you tell it what target you're on, which is Raspberry Pi for me. Um, and then there's these recipes for different tool chains is what they're called um, for this NERVS Raspberry Pi thing down here. Basically, that's what tells um, the magic fairy dust how to work. Um, it's a special brand of unicorn shavings or something, I don't know. Um, so then you bake it. Um, so you, you do bake system get and that gets your system. And then you do bake toolchain get and that gets your toolchain. Um, those are just magic words that you have to say. And then you do bake firmware and then you get a firmware. So that, that's the part that makes sense. Um, and then you do this magic command. Oh, yeah, so if you're on a Mac, you can do bake burn. That makes a lot of sense. This is the Linux way to do it because Linux people like to be cool uh, and have lots of command line switches and stuff. Um, so you do sudo fwop, right? So you're, you're invoking the lower level command, whereas the, the intention is for bake to make that consistent interface for people eventually, uh, but it's not quite ready yet. So that's how we burn our Gibson image to, a, to an SD card. Um, and I won't talk about that yet because I want to turn this on because I already did that. And because I wanted to actually work, I did it at home instead of here. So I'm powering on my Raspberry Pi. Let's see if I can even show it on the screen before it's done booting. Yes, okay. Is this the original Raspberry Pi or This is the super old one, like first generation. Um, so it just booted in four seconds, um, and now it's doing the Gibson pattern, is what I've called this. Uh, it was gonna be way cooler, and then it was 1 a.m. last night, and it just didn't happen. <laughs> um, so yeah, that was, that was cool. Um, so basically that is um, the quick demo of running a NERVS app on a Raspberry Pi and driving these cool, uh, uh, Adafruit calls them NeoPixels, they're RGB LEDs, so I've made them green, but they aren't always green. Will that run on the five or $10 Raspberry? The zero, will it run on the zero? Um, the zero isn't supported yet mainly because the people that are working on NERVS can't get them because they aren't available. Um, so someone would need to make a board support package for it and nobody on the NERVS team has one right now. Uh, it should run. It's the same processor as the Pi 2, I think. But it's, what, 10, 5 or 10 dollars? Yeah, they're 5 bucks if you can get a Raspberry Pi Zero. Um, they're, they're, I think they were selling them for 10 like on launch day, if you wanted more than one. Um, I have not gotten my hands on one, uh, so I have not played with it. Um, the other thing that I wanted to show, go back to the slides. So Erlang distribution is something you may have heard of. Um, that's how Erlang does its clustering. Um, one of the problems is you have, to have, you have to have a name, right? We have no names, man. No names, nameless. Um, so in your NERVS app, right, how would you configure the node name, right? Because it's this NERVS thing. You're writing Elixir code, and then it just magically, something gets on the, on the SD card, right? So there's this thing. You can put it in the rel. Um, you can put some VM args in the... Uh, rel folder and people are starting to chuckle because they see that the cookie's God. Um, that's that's most common password is God, right? So um, the cookie is the magic sauce that lets two um, Erlang nodes know that they're allowed to talk to each other, um, and they use that during their you know handshaking protocol at the beginning. Um, and then the thing down at the bottom there, uh, this is how you tell it that you want to run an IEX shell um, when you boot it up. And then you might do something like this. This is where I was gonna have a demo of actually hacking the Gibson from another Raspberry Pi and like rewriting the code so it has the cookie monster virus and there's yellow dots going up. It, didn't, it just didn't pan out. So we'll imagine that that happened and you'll all be like, wow. <laughs> so, um, but this is how you might do it, right? You'd run IEX with, um, with the short name um, and give it the cookie so that you can connect. And then you can just do a node spawn link um, and tell it which node you would like to connect to, and it finds it on the internet, and then you install your virus. And will hilarity support, ensues. Will it support names? Yeah, you just do dash name, dash dash name instead of s name. Um, I, I assume you're talking about like if you wanted to use an IP address or an internet name. Or, right, that's, that's good on a LAN segment. Yeah, so some of the struggle that I had with trying to get the demo working was that um, like I'm booting from DHCP on there with the network stack, and then I need to have it registered in DNS so that stuff works, and I didn't know what kind of network environment we would have here, if any, so um, I was trying to run DHCP on the Raspberry Pi using an Erlang thing that exists for that, and then I was gonna run DNS and have them talk to each other. It was gonna be awesome, uh, but that didn't work out, so maybe next year, you know. So that, that's my talk. Um, I wanted to, you know, if people are interested in hacking and, you know, if you brought a Raspberry Pi or if you own one or whatever, uh, certainly check it out. Um, 
I brought a couple SD cards that have stuff on it that we can what play with. What do you see is, it, is the potential of this, this platform? I mean, are there any limitations to this compared to, I mean, where do you see the limitations? What do you see the opportunities? Um, yeah, so limitations and opportunities for this platform um, basically are limited by the Raspberry Pi, but um, you can, you know, you can tune your code to do things efficiently. You can get a lot of performance out of a Raspberry Pi. I think where it really shines is that it's, um, it's small and getting smaller. So as you get used to the tooling, you know, the, the stuff's going to get smaller and the tools are going to get better. So it's good to be getting in now and getting used to it so that, you know, if you're developing some product, like for example, um, the Rosepoint guys obviously are developing products that they're selling, but there's some people online that are, you know, making um, Wi-Fi garage door opener thing that, you know, you can, you can run Phoenix on there, right? So you can have a web server, you can have sockets and, um, Somebody else is, is making a proximity sensor-based horse feeder, um, cat, cat feeder initially, and then, and then working towards a horse feeder. Like the animal walks up to it, and then it has a servo that like, outputs some food. Yeah, Wendy, Wendy Smoke is doing some cool stuff. Um, so I think the sweet spot there is basically whatever you can imagine that would need a small computer, I guess. And then the limitation is, um, you know, they are constrained hardware-wise, but Honestly, like maybe you can show us how to melt one, but like I can't think of anything that would need a lot of processing power so much as just being small and yeah. blinking LEDs is main is mainly what I'm trying to do. So. There's nothing that, that the hardware is capable of that Elixir can't reach. Oh yeah, right. Um, so I guess I didn't talk about that in this talk. Last month I talked a little bit about how I actually interfaced with the NeoPixels. Um, so I did that by writing a little bit of C code and then using an Elixir port to talk to the C code in a way that won't crash the Erlang VM. Um, so basically if you can do it in C, you just write it in C and then you talk to it from Elixir on the board. So yeah, anything that talks to a file descriptor. Um, basically it's Linux, right? So if you can get it to work in Linux um, as a driver or as a user land app, um, I'm just I'm doing this in user land because I don't know how kernel packages work, but um, you could easily do that. And the nice thing about Raspberry Pi is that there's a huge community, so people come up with these things, right? You don't have to figure it out from scratch and uh, read the enormous data sheet to figure out which memory offset to talk to. But yeah, it's just Linux, so I mean, all the hardware is is there to be used. Cool. So, any questions or thoughts? It looks great. I mean, it's a lot of potential. Yeah. Because a lot of times in these embedded things, you know, you go back to the trash heap and all this other stuff. It takes you six months to hobble something together, and the fact that you've got the power of Elixir on a device like that, it's it's, it's incredible. Yeah, and it mostly just works, and you also get Erlang too. So you get the power of Elixir, but sometimes you just reach into Erlang too, and there's different Erlang libraries that are out there. You can um, so, you, again, you get all the tooling of Elixir, too, which is awesome on an embedded device, because normally people are used to doing this stuff in C, and I don't even, I just can't even, like. <laughs> well, the beauty of this is that for anybody, you should be able to learn how to send a message from device A to device B. Right. And they shouldn't have to worry about what the network stack is and, and you know, flushing buffers and, and you know, and all the, the, the two byte headers on a TCP IP and you know, all that crap that I do. Yeah. It's basically just this one line to talk to another node in Elixir, right? Right there. <laughs> Whereas in C, it's like, okay, you open the socket and then you forget to garbage collect it and then the thing crashes a week later. And, you know, like embedded, usually you have a long lifetime of the product being turned on, right? And so you have to worry a lot about memory leaks and corruption and stuff that uh, Elixir and Erlang just do well. Do you, do you know anybody <clears throat> other than Garth that has like a commercial product there? So anybody other than Garth using this as a commercial product, um, I, I don't think so, because in his talk, he was saying, why is nobody using this? Like, yeah, right. I'm using it, and it seems awesome. I don't know why no one else has found it. So I think it's going to light up, though, because after he gave his talk, basically, like, I saw it. Everybody, a lot of people joined the Nerves channel after seeing that talk. So I think he's kind of opened the floodgates, and I'm just amplifying, right? So and now you guys are all going to be excited about it and tell everybody about it and play with it. And so. Nice. Nice. So the Raspberry Pi has a camera. I don't know if that is a good use case for that particular <laughs> app. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, so that's, that's the wrong thing to do with Internet of Things, is put a camera in the bathroom on, on the Internet. It'll, it'll, it'll beat out stupid yeah, because Shodan is a thing. I don't know if you, you guys have probably heard of that, but if not, there's a search engine for things that shouldn't be on the Internet. It's called Shodan. Yes. Um, so you just type in, like, I want to look at open webcams right now, and then it's just like, here they all are. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I haven't tracked it down myself. Let's just... Cool, so that's it.